Word Studies with Dr. Ray Winston, a powerful and in-depth study of the Word of God. Dr. Ray? Psalm 119.105 says, That word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Well, welcome to Word Studies. I am Dr. Ray, and I want to thank God for the opportunity to study with you the ever-living Word of God. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the Word of God is quick, and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Welcome again to Word Studies. On this program, we study in depth the words of God. Recently, we have been studying on the pneumatica. Pneumatica, of course, is a Greek word for spiritual things, spiritual matters, things of the spirit. In particular, however, we're going to be looking at looking at something that is perhaps, perhaps, I said perhaps, off the beaten path, because we're going to be looking at new things, as it were. New, brand new. Remember, Jesus himself, or God, if you will, talked about things that are new. They're not old things. Says, old things have passed away. Remember in, in, in Corinthians, <clears throat> where it says old things have passed away? Behold, all things have become new. So therefore, we're going to be looking at new things in in light of the fact that this is a quote unquote new year. Yeah, in, in Westernized uh, 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 countries. Yeah, like America, Canada, uh, uh, <clears throat> Mexico, if you will, many other many uh, countries. This is a new year, and therefore, uh, it, it was celebrated in various countries overseas and all all, all over the place that this is a new year. <clears throat> However, we're going to find out that uh, the Jewish New Year does not necessarily uh, match up with our New Year, okay? Because God does things new. God is a new God. We're going to find out in in the book of Revelation, chapter 21, where God is going to do something new, yeah? But we're not going to even start with the New Testament, the new, quote-unquote, New Testament. We're going to start with the... Old Testament, as it were, yeah, <clears throat> about something new, if you will, because God is always doing things new. We don't, so many times we don't get it that he's doing something new, but he does. There are three <clears throat> Greek words for new. Uh, let's see, what's the first one? The first one is kainos, uh, and then there's another one, heteros, and then the one that we're going to be zeroing in, zeroing in on is naos, because naos concerns time, as it were, new things in time. The other two, not necessarily in time, but uh, whether something is the same kind or whether it's something different, if, if you will, <clears throat> kainos and heteros. We're going to look at those later, but right now we're going to we're going to uh, focus, as it were, on naos concerning time. <clears throat> we're going to start, believe it or not, in the book of Exodus, the second book in the Bible, if you will. Yeah, it's it's part of the Torah, if you will, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, or the Torah. Yeah, and we're going to be looking at uh, the second book uh, in the Torah in, in the Jewish culture. It's called. Torah in the Old Testament. Now, in your Bible, I want you to turn to the book of Exodus chapter 12, as a matter of fact. Yeah. As a matter of fact, uh, Exodus chapter 12 kind of correlates with two New Testament uh, books, if you will. Uh, They are 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting at verse 23, and Matthew chapter, no, Mark, Mark, Chapter 14. Uh, let's go back to, to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We can start at verse 17, actually. And uh, Mark chapter 14, if you will. Also, we're going to be looking first, though, at Exodus chapter 12. So if you've got a Bible, you can turn to Exodus chapter 12. When you're there, let me know, and we'll get started, okay? Exodus chapter 12, as a matter, uh, as a matter of fact, we're going to be starting at verse 1. When usually, when pastors, preachers, teachers of the Word, if they give you the chapter and they don't mention a particular verse, well, usually they're starting at verse 1. Yeah, because they say, okay, uh, uh, Exodus chapter 12, I don't have to say, uh, or unless 
I plan to start at verse 17. Yeah, I would just simply say Exodus chapter 12, and, and you would uh, you would assume that is that I'm starting at verse 1, which I am at verse 1. Exodus chapter 12, verse 1. Now notice what it says. Now the Lord spoke to Moshe. I know your Bible doesn't say Moshe because Moshe is a Hebrew word for Moses. Okay, so when you get to heaven, if you say Moses, he's probably going to give you a second look. Say, my name is Moshe. That's what his name is, Moshe. And Aaron in the land of Egypt. Now, they were in the land of Egypt. Now, the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, now, here is where God is going to change time, if you will. Yeah. Because many remember when God made time stand still. Well, he's the only one who was able to do it. We try to do it, yeah, without daylight saving time and so forth like that, you know, where we have more daylight and, and less uh, uh, in the evenings. <laughs> yeah, we try to uh, uh, change time, but we can't really change it. We're not really changing anything. We're changing our calendars or, or, or our clocks might be a better way of saying it. But changing a clock does not necessarily change time. Time just goes on and on and on and on. Yeah. Okay. And let me read that verse one again. In, in uh, Exodus chapter 12, the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt saying, this month shall be your beginning of months. In other words, for Israel, this month that we're going to be talking about is going to be their beginning of month now, it doesn't necessarily refer to our westernized calendar. Notice, he says, this month shall be your, he's talking about the nation of Israel, beginning of month. It shall be the first month of the year to you. He's not about. He's not talking about me. He's not talking about uh, the White House, yeah, or, or any other westernized uh, country, if you will. He's talking about the first month to you, Israel. Now, notice what he says in verse 2. Three, that is, speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, on the tenth of this month, every man. Now, when God says every man, he's talking about every man of Israel, not every man in the world, yeah, not Gentiles, if you will, which is what we are, yeah, we're Gentiles, and of course, then he's talking to Israel, notice, he says, to every man shall take for himself a lamb, lamb, what's the Hebrew word for lamb, keves, yeah, take for himself a lamb, a lamb. Now, the lamb, notice, I'll just keep reading, because I want to explain things before I even get to them. Yeah, notice. According to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. In other words, each household could share a lamb, a single lamb. You don't want to kill five or six lambs, but one lamb. Yeah. Why? Only one lamb. Suppose I got 25 kids. Yeah. And I still have only one lamb. Yeah. Because this lamb represents the Son of God, or Yeshua, Jesus. One lamb. He was one lamb, yeah, that died for the whole world. Now, this lamb, though, is not going to die for the whole world. He's only going to die, as it were, for the, for the family that lived inside of that particular house. Why? We're going to find out why in a moment. Notice. According to the, it says, every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. Note, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for the lamb, let he, him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of the persons, according to each man's need, you shall make your count for the lamb. Now, in a Jewish culture, the father in the home was supposed to know exactly how much food each member of his family normally consumed. Now, you might think that, well, that's impossible because I don't always watch my kids when they're having hamburgers at McDonald's or something like that. So how could I do that today? Yeah. Well, actually, when I was being raised up, now, I'm not that old. <laughs> yeah. But when I was being raised up, we always had dinner. We had not necessarily breakfast, but we had uh, uh, dinner and supper. Yeah. 
Okay, maybe we had breakfast together, not lunch, because we were, you know, wherever. But we always had supper. I remember supper, had supper together. And therefore, you knew how much your, your children could eat because many times it was first come, first served, yeah, at our, at our house. <clears throat> and if you were late getting there, you know, the best part of the chicken was gone by the time you got there. You were left with a chicken leg yeah, or a chicken foot or something or other like that. Yeah. So you had to show up and you had to show up on time if you wanted one of the better pieces of the chicken. <clears throat> yeah. So notice, though, here. The number of persons, according to each man's need, you shall make your account for the lamb. And, of course, the father knew. You know, he had one child over here, he barely ate anything, and then another one would try to eat up everything. I remember a friend of ours who we had a, that I went to school with, and uh, this was in uh, high school, I guess, and he ate, he ate so much. He was thin. He didn't weigh very much, but he was really thin. And uh, But he would eat up everything he could find, yeah? And fa finally, his father said, you know, I got to break uh, La France. His name was La France. I got to break La France of this habit of overeating, just eating, 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 eating. So he, uh, what did he do? He, he cooked all of this food and he sat La France in front of him and said, you got to eat it all. You know, like he had to eat two chickens and a bowl, uh, a, a big boiler of rice and all kinds of uh, vegetables and whatever, all at the same time within an hour. Well, obviously, he got sick after eating all that food, but that broke broke him the habit of overeating. So, therefore, the father knew, this father did, uh, how much his fat, because he had other children, they didn't overeat, but this one, I don't know what's wrong with him. Maybe he had a parasite. Notice, <clears throat> it says, next to your house, take it according to the number of persons, according to each man's need, you shall make your count for the lamb. To make sure that you have plenty of food for everybody that was in the house, and or if you didn't have any children and your neighbor didn't have any, you could kill one lamb. But if the neighbor was going to share your lamb, they had to come to your house or vice versa. Yeah, it could be, okay, I'll just take a dish over there to them. No, they all had to be in the same house. We're going to find out why in a moment. Notice, your lamb in verse 5 shall be without blemish a male of the first year. Now, Jesus, when we say a male of the first year, that means the, the first male born to that, uh, in that, as that offspring had to be a male of the first year. And, in other words, that male lamb had to be the firstborn from that particular mother, the firstborn. Yeah. Why, Dr. Ray? Because that lamb represents our Savior, our Lord and Savior, Yeshua, Jesus. Yes? So he was the firstborn. Jesus was the firstborn in his family. I was the firstborn in my family. I mean, that may not mean that much to you, but in, in Jewish culture, the firstborn uh, had extra rights, if you will, uh, 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 inheritances. Like if there was an inheritance, say the father passed on, the mother passed on, or whatever, uh, in the family, then what was left over, a double portion went to the firstborn. I'm still waiting for my double portion, incidentally. So, you know, that doesn't work necessarily for Gentiles, remember? I'm a Gentile. Notice, your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You may take it from the sheep or from the goat. So it, maybe you didn't have any sheep, but you found a goat. You know, goats were kind of wanderers, if you will. You could kind of go up in the mountain or something and find yourself a goat. Yeah. Whereas you may not have any sheep. Maybe you were an agrarian uh, type of family that didn't raise animals, so you didn't have any sheep. Right? Well, that's why you say you could, you could use a goat or a sheep. It says they have to be without blemish. Now, how would you know whether he was without blemish? Well, in the Jewish culture with the uh, rabbis and the, and the uh, Sadducees and Pharisees and so forth, yeah, the, uh, the, the animal that you were going to sacrifice had to be inspected. I think it was 36 different inspections, if I'm not overstating it, that that lamb, that, uh, uh, lamb uh, whether it was a sheep or a goat, had to go through. And they had to pass all of those 36 uh uh, or, or inspection point, yeah? He couldn't have anything wrong with him. Yeah, he, he couldn't have a sniffle, couldn't have nothing, couldn't have a broken fingernail, yeah, broken toe, and nothing was wrong with him. 
That's why we knew, know, that is, that Jesus had nothing wrong with him. He was not sick. He was not sniffly. He didn't have broken nails. He didn't have a broken arm. He didn't have anything wrong with him. Yeah? His body was the most perfect body <clears throat> that ever lived upon this earth realm. Yeah? Was the body of Jesus. Absolutely. Not. He was without blemish. Notice. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now, notice verse 6. You shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Okay? That's two weeks, right? The 14th day by our calendar. It's two weeks. The 14th day of the same month. Then what are you going to do after the 14th day, uh, 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 Dr. Ray? Why 14 days anyway? Well, it took all of this time to determine whether your lamb was without blemish. Otherwise, you couldn't sacrifice it. That's when the Jews, when the Jews were, after they came out of Egypt and they were going through through the wilderness and so forth like that, and then they got to the uh, the tabernacle and, and so forth, and, and they brought their lambs to be sacrificed, uh, you know, for a sin that they had committed or something of that nature. That lamb had to be without blemish. You couldn't just bring an old cripple lamb up there. Right? Okay, I just found this old goat. I mean, he's got a the broken hip or something. No, <clears throat> unacceptable. Had to be without blemish. Okay. Why? Because that was representing Yeshua, Jesus. Notice. Notice then. Notice. 14 days. you got to keep it up for 14 days. On the 14th day, that is, of the same month, then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it when? At twilight. What's twilight? Twilight. Twilight is between the evenings in Jerusalem, in Israel. Okay? Between the evenings. Now, what do I mean by between the evenings? I know somebody's calling me right now saying, I know what between the evenings is talking about, perhaps. Yeah. Even between the evenings, they have to drink water once in a while. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Now, we're going to look at, we're going to find out what between the evenings is talking about. Okay. Excuse me. Now, between the evenings in Israel, they had two evenings, if you will. One of them was like 3 o'clock in the evening, in the afternoon, that is. And the other one was like 6 o'clock uh, uh, in the evening. Uh, Any time between that, Jesus died, as it were, between 3 p.m. and 6 p.m. Between those two evenings is when he died. Okay? When they, when they nailed him to the cross and he died. Okay? Now, that's why, notice, then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. That's between the evenings, okay, between 3 and 6 p.m. And, of course, the whole assembly of Israel were responsible, as it were, for the death of Jesus. The whole assembly, not just some, not just the deacons and, 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 and the pastors and the assistant pastors or something or other like that, or a choir member. No, the whole assembly, the whole nation of Israel, as it were, were responsible. Notice. And they shall take some of the blood, in verse 7, some of the blood, and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses. Now, what are the two doorposts? Somebody said, what are the two doorposts? Well, those, you know, doors stand between posts, right? They're so they have those posts that you can see the actual posts rather than the way we do it now. We do it fancy or er. And we can't see the post. The post is on the inside, but they have the post where you can see the post. And they would put blood on the post and on the lintel of the house. Lintel being above the door, okay? There was blood on the sides. There was blood on the top. And guess what? There was blood on the bottom. Where did the blood on the bottom come from? That's where they killed the lamb. And that blood went into a trough. They had a kind of a trough at the bottom of that door. Not something that would trip you up. <clears throat> Basically, what people would might use for a water runoff or something like that, but in that uh, little runoff place also. So that whole door was surrounded by the blood of the Lamb. Okay, notice. Okay, and on the lintel of the houses where they eat it. In other words, the door was surrounded or covered by the blood of Jesus, if you will. That was represented by the lambs at that time, of course, the blood of those lambs. Ultimately, by the blood of Jesus. Guess who's covered by his blood now? 
Does anybody know who, who's covered by his blood now? We are. Yeah, I am. And you are if you are a, a child of God. If you're born again, yeah? If you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, he died for the whole world. Have you ever read John 3.16? Even non-believers know what John 3.16 says. They've seen it so much at football games, basketball games, wherever. Yeah. You are somebody will come up with John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him would not perish but have what? Everlasting life. Yes. That's because of his blood, yeah? And this, what they were doing here, they, you know, with Moses, some, I don't know how long ago, that 400 years or so before the birth of Christ, yeah? They were doing this here when they came out of the land of Egypt. Then, notice what it says in verse 8, then they shall eat the flesh on that night. They're going to eat the flesh. Many people will wonder, how, how could that represent Jesus, eating the flesh of a lamb represent Jesus? Well, if you ever read, have ever read the, the, the book of John, chapter 6, yeah, Jesus himself said it, eat my flesh, and what else? Drink my blood. Well, you know, a lot of Jews, when Jesus said that, well, they were out of there. They said, well, you know what, uh, everything else you said is okay, but uh, I know the Old Testament says that we cannot eat the blood of an animal. And it, it obviously, we're not cannibalistic, so therefore, we cannot eat your flesh and, and, and drink your blood. Yeah? That's a metaphor. <laughs> yeah? Not literally. How, how are they going to eat Jesus' uh, this flesh and drink his blood literally? But we can today. Yeah, we can eat his flesh and drink his blood. Have you ever read uh, Mark chapter 14, verses uh, 12, starting at verse 12, that is? Mark chapter 14, verse 12. We're not going to take the time to read that. We, we, ultimately, we're going to get to that. So you'll know what eat my flesh and drink my blood is talking about, okay? And then we're going to look at John chapter 6. Notice, here, we're still in Exodus chapter 12, in case you're wondering, well, where's that preacher at? Is that in the Bible, or did he make up his own Bible? No, I didn't make up no, any Bible. The Bible's been around for what, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 years? Who knows? The Old and New Testament. Then they shall eat the flesh on that night. Notice, it was that night. Roasted in what? Roasted in fire. Underline the word roasted. Notice what it says. With what kind of bread? With unleavened bread. What's unleavened bread? In the Hebrew, it's called matzah. Okay? It's matzah. Matzot would be the plural for more than one bread, I suppose you're right, sir. With unleavened bread, with bitter herbs, they shall eat it. Why bitter herbs? Yeah, the bread, the unleavened bread represented, or the matzah, represented the body of Christ. Unleavened bread, okay? So, this gives you kind of an indication how it is that we today can eat his flesh. Yeah, notice. Notice. With unleavened bread. Why unleavened bread? Because somebody might ask me, well, Dr. Ray, what's unleavened bread? You know, bread is bread, isn't it? Uh, you know, I went to the store yesterday to Ralph's and I got a loaf of bread. Yeah, whole wheat. Yeah. So, oh, so what's the big deal about this unleavened bread? Is this some kind of special bread that only the Jews ate? No, you can eat it too. Today, yeah. When whenever you have communion, you're supposed to be serving Unleavened bread, bread, not soda crackers, not cookies, not uh, something that grandma made, not whole cakes, yeah, but unleavened bread. What is unleavened bread? Well, when the Jews came out of the land of Egypt, they were in a hurry, yeah, because Pharaoh had said no 25, no, 10 times, uh, 9 times, and on the 10th time, uh, you know, he finally said, okay, y'all can go, because you're just messing up my whole country. Everything is being destroyed. So uh, get out here, and what do you want? You know, they took everything that they could take, you know, gold and, di and diamonds and jewelry and so forth like that, the, the Jews did. They just wanted them out of there, you know, because bad stuff was happening to all of their buildings, all of their statues, all of, there were bugs everywhere, there were flies everywhere, there were blood running in, this, in, the, in the ocean, and in the sea, it was just a mess. And then they, Pharaoh finally, uh, uh, 
had enough brain power to say, well, okay, it must be they, they must have a stronger guard than my guards. I got all these guards, and they can't handle that one guard. She's really in trouble here. So get them out of here. You know, let them go. Notice. Unleavened bread, though. That's bread that hasn't risen. They didn't have time for the bread to rise, as it were. Yeah? They didn't have time to put the baking powder in it and cook it and let it rise up and, and, and be, uh, 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 you know, a biscuit, if you will. So they had unleavened bread. Yeah? It didn't have time to rise. Now, unleavened bread also represents righteousness. There's leavened bread. Leavened bread is what you buy at Ralph's. You know, I love for light bread. You know, it just rolls up up there. You buy biscuits and they rise up. Okay, that represents unrighteousness or sinfulness, if you will. Unleavened bread represents the body of Christ. And you'll find out that Jesus said, eat my flesh and drink my blood. We're going to find out about that. Yeah, okay. That flesh is represented by unleavened bread. Okay, what about the bitter herbs, Dr. Ray? Are you going to skip something that, that you don't get it? Bitter herbs. Bitter herbs was the bitterness that the, that the Hebrews suffered for 400 years uh, in slavery in the land of Egypt. A lot of people think, well, the Jews, you know, that uh, black people in America were the only people that were ever slaves. I got, as Terry Davis Jr. would say, I got news for you. That ain't necessarily so. <laughs> yeah, there were people, the Jews were 400 years slaves. Uh, the, the black people in America, I think, were only slaves for 200 years. I'm right, either right or wrong. Yeah, somewhere around that area. But the Jews, 400 years in the land of Egypt, they were slaves. Okay? That was after Joseph. You remember Joseph, the son of Jacob, that was sold into slavery into Egypt, and he became one of the leaders in Egypt when he died. Then the next uh, 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 pharaoh didn't know who, who the, the Jews were. Yeah, so they made them slaves. And they thought, well, if we don't make them slaves, they might take over our country. You know, It's like something like what we're doing today, isn't it? Yeah. If we don't build a big steel 50-foot-high wall, I don't know how tall that wall is, but as tall as tall a wall as we can get, then the 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 the, the, the uh, Mexicans will take over America. So, so therefore, we got to build this big tall wall and put guns and bombs all along the wall there in order to to protect our our, our country. Okay. Yeah, well, the same thing was, was, was in, in essence was happening with the Egyptians. They thought that okay, they'll choose. They, you know, we gave them a place to stay over there. Why don't they stay over there? <laughs> stay in your place. <laughs> yeah, but they said okay, then rather than take a chance, you know, we're 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 gonna uh, we're gonna make those Jews uh, slaves. You know, four hundred years. I can imagine four hundred years that it lasted all that time that they were slaves in Egypt. Okay. Okay, somebody said it was 430 years, perhaps. Notice. The story said, what's 30 years compared to 400? Notice. Unleavened bread and bitter herbs, they shall eat it. Do notice verse 9. Are you listening? Somebody said, oh, I'll turn that preacher off because I don't want to hear this. You know, I mean, this happened something well, way before Jesus was born. What's that got to do with me today? Everything. Notice verse 8, 9, that is. Do not eat it raw nor boiled at all with water, but roast it in fire. Why can't I boil it? Why can't I fry it? Yeah, I like fried fish. Yeah, why can't I fry it? Why can't I boil it? Why can't I bake it? Yeah, or, or, but the only way I can do it, according to Scripture, is to be roasted in fire. Okay, what does that represent, Dr. Ray? Or what is that a metaphor for? A metaphor for well, that metaphor is that this this lamb represented Jesus hanging on the cross, if you will. Okay, he he was roasted, and I'm roasted out of time. If this program has been a blessing to you and your family, or has helped you in any way, please feel free to write to us and pray for us. Remember, also, we need and appreciate your financial support. Please send your financial gifts and love offerings to Dr. Ray Winston at P.O. Box 1173, Culver City, California, 90232. That's Dr. Ray Winston, P.O. Box 1173, Culver City, California, 90232. You also may call Dr. Ray at area code 310-559-8320 or 800-747-8320. Remember also... 
God loves a cheerful giver. 